Hi there, this is Siwan, and in this lecture, we will be looking at strabismus and an approach. So firstly, we'll be looking at a brief overview, followed by the classification in etiology, how to evaluate a patient with strabismus, some differential diagnosis, some common uh, ESO and EXO deviations encountered in children, and some general principles of management. So what is strabismus? Strabismus is defined as an ocular misalignment. Now it's termed atropia when this misalignment is manifest and aphoria when it's latent or hidden. In general, atropia causes the propia if it's acquired after the age of 7 to 9, whereas younger children under the age of 6 to 7 years old tend to cortically suppress vision from the deviating eye. Hence, a symptom of diplopia sometimes can give us a clue to the age of onset. Strabismus can be horizontal, vertical, torsional, or any combination of these. So there are two main ways of classifying strabismus. Firstly, it can be broadly classified into comitant and incomitant causes, where comitant means that the angle of deviation is similar in all directions of gaze, and incompetent strabismus means that deviation varies in different directions of gaze. Another way to classify it would be according to its etiology, so where it can be idiopathic, uh, related to a refractive error, restrictive, for example due to thyroid eye disease, paralytic, or sensory due to poor vision in the eye. Now in the evaluation of the strabismic patient, some general principles apply. Now, the goals of examination would be firstly, to identify the presence of amblyopia, if any. So as discussed in the amblyopia lecture, a strabismus which has a strong fixation preference of one eye has a higher risk of developing amblyopia, as opposed to one that freely alternates. Secondly, you need to establish a diagnosis. Thirdly, assess the binocular status of the child. So we want to know their fusion potential, um, if there's diplopia, is the child suppressing, and if there's any steropsis. Fourthly, and to measure and characterize the ocular deviation. Fifth, but most importantly, to rule out any underlying neurological cause to the ocular deviation. Now in the history, a thorough birth history is important, including gestational age, birth weight, if there was any ROP present, general health and developmental milestones as well. Family history of strabismus is important, age of onset, and some characteristics um, of the strabismus, whether it's there all the time or intermittent, as in one eye or alternating, comitant, incomitant, if there's any compensatory head posture, and if there was any precipitating cause noted. Other symptoms that may suggest you know, more sinister neurological cause, such as headache, nausea, and vomiting, also need to be elicited, and any history of trauma. In the examination, inspection alone can give you many clues. So look for the alignment, check the Hirschberg's reflex, see if there's a manifest, Strabismus, look for any fixation preference, look to see if there's any abnormal head posture. Visual acuity assessment needs to be age appropriate. In older children, linear acuity would be preferred over single optotype testing as the latter tends to um, underestimate the degree of amblyopia as it lacks crowding. Check stereoacuity if possible on older children and look for any fusion or suppression using the worth four dots, again in all the children. Ductions and versions are important in nine positions of gaze. At the same time, look for any presence of oblique muscle dysfunction that can be commonly associated with some types of strabismus. Next, you want to measure the ocular deviation. Now, it's critical that the patient is fixing um, during this assessment. Light reflex tests are easiest to perform on younger children, though they are not as precise. And in all the children, or, or those who are more cooperative, the cover-uncover test is ideal. So the cover-uncover test will detect a tropia and a foria, respectively. And the alternate cover brings out the full deviation of the strabismus. Using a prism will, give you an, will, be, will help you quantify the amount of deviation. 
and you may, you know, check, measure the deviation in different cases if you suspect an incompetent cause. And if it was incompetent, you need to measure both the primary and secondary deviations. A cyclopedic refraction should be performed and always examine the fundus. So in general, when managing a child with strabismus, any refractive error should first be corrected. This is based on cycloplegic refraction, and if there's an esotropia present, prescribe the full hypobic sphere. If there's any amblyopia, this should be treated with occlusion therapy. Orthoptic treatment um, may be started if indicated, such as fusion exercises in older children with convergence insufficiency intermittent XT. And surgery may be considered in select cases. So when you see a child with esotropia, what are the differential diagnoses that come to mind? Well, I find it helps first to decide if the strabismus is comitant or not. So some comitant causes could be due to infantile esotropia, accommodative esotropia, a non-accommodative acquired esotropia, a consecutive esotropia if there was a history of um, surgery and previous XT, or a cyclic esotropia if it was intermittent, so this is quite rare. Incompetent causes can be due to Duane syndrome type 1, a cranial nerve 6 palsy, Mobius syndrome, nystagmus blockage syndrome, or myasthenia gravis. Infantile esotropia is a condition that you need to be familiar with. So some characteristics is that the onset is usually from birth to about six months of age. It's characterized by large angle constant esotropia of more than 40 prism diopters. Spontaneous resolution is rare and amblyopia is common. And some associated features such as inferior oblique overaction, dissociated vertical deviation, and later nystagmus can be seen. Now they have this smooth pursuit asymmetry which can be demonstrated on the OKN drum. So where there's a deficiency in the nasal to temporal pursuit compared to the temporal to nasal pursuit. This is a manifestation of visual motor immaturity. Therefore when you see this in older children and adults with an esotropia, it really is a sign of a neonatal onset. Okay, now let's move on to some pictures, something a little bit more exciting. Okay, so this child on the top, so what it shows is that the Hirschberg's light reflex is slightly uh, temporal in the right eye, showing an esotropia. So this child has a large angle infantile esotropia. Now what does the bottom picture show? So as you can see, this patient is looking towards his right and fixing with his right eye. And you can see the left eye deviating upwards. So this shows the presence of an inferior oblique overaction of the left eye. Now in this last picture, as you can see, there's a uh, occluder over the left eye and there's a slow updrift of the eye that's occluded. So this shows dissociated vertical deviation of the left eye. So in the management of infantile esotropia, like in any form of strabismus, first you need to correct any amblyopia present. Now you would consider surgical correction if there's a constant large angle esotropia and this should be stable over at least two examinations. So the Surgery in this group of children will usually be early with the aim of restoring stereoacuity. And usually it's done between the age of six months to one year old. And um, so this is in order to achieve peripheral fusion and low grade um, stereoacuity. Though there have been reports of high grade stereoacuity in very early surgery, three to four months old. Another form, another common cause of esotropia in children is accommodative esotropia. Now this is due to hyperopia 
resulting in increased accommodation to achieve a clear image, resulting in an overconvergence and an isotropia. It can be classified into fully accommodative, partially accommodative, and either of these can be associated with a high ACA ratio. Or So moving on to some um, clinical features. So in children with accommodative isotropia, they usually have it between one to three years of age. It may occur in infancy. It's usually a variable moderate to large angle isotropia from 20 to about 50 prism diopters. Initially, it's intermittent and then can progress to a constant isotropia and usually associated with hypermetropia about plus two to plus six diopterosphere. A family history is common, and it may be precipitated by trauma or illness. Now, the management goal is to really align the eyes as soon as possible in order to re-establish binocular fusion and prevent amblyopia. So all children will require cyclo refraction. And subsequently, the full hyperopic correction should be prescribed. Child will then be evaluated after for fixation preference in any residual isotropia present. So if the child if the child has been prescribed spectacles and this corrects the isotropia for both distance and near, you would term this a fully accommodative isotropia. And all the child will require is single vision spectacles. Now if with the spectacles the isotropia is corrected for distance, but there's still a residual isotropia more than 10 prism diopters for near. Now, this is termed a fully accommodative isotropia, but with a high ACA ratio, and so this child will need bifocal glasses. If there's a residual isotropia of more than 10 prism diopters with glasses for both distance and near, this is termed a partially accommodative isotropia, and surgery will be indicated for the angle of isotropia that's not corrected by glasses. Okay, so in this top picture, can you tell me what type of accommodative isotropia this child has? So you can see in the uh, left-hand side picture, she has a bright isotropia. With um, hyperopic glasses, she is now straight. So this is a fully accommodative isotropia. Now this child in the bottom left picture, as you can see, even with the full hyperopic uh, prescription, still has a residual left isotropia. So this child um, has what we call a partial, partially accommodative isotropia. Now this child, um, just to note that this child is fixing um, at distance and at near, the angle will also be similar. And this last picture here, so in picture A, you can see that the child firstly is wearing bifocals and looking through the top segment of the bifocals, um, he or she still has a right isotropia present. Now in picture B, you can see the child is now fixing, uh, fixing at the same near target using the lower segment of the bifocal glasses. So this tells you that this child has a accommodative isotropia with a high ACA ratio and therefore requires bifocal glasses. And now we move on to a different diagnose, differential diagnosis of a child presenting with an exotropia. So again, it is helpful to Divide them into comitant causes and incomitant causes. So intermittent exotropia is one of the most common causes, most common forms of exotropia. We'll be going into it into more detail. It usually presents after one year of age with a large exophoria that spontaneously becomes manifest. When the child is fusing, they have high-grade stereoacuity, but when they manifest, they, be, they, they tend to suppress. And this can be precipitated by bright light, illness, or fatigue. 
And it's a rare subtype of intermittent exotropia where there's a presence of high hypermetropia with exotropia, where the where hypoaccommodation can cause an exotropia. But like I said, it's quite rare. Now, in general, intermittent exotropia can be classified into three types. This is based on the difference between the distance and near deviation. So firstly, it can be basic, where the distance and near deviations are similar or within 10 prism diopters of each other. Secondly, there can be a divergence excess pattern, where the exotropia is larger for distance than near. This has to be more than 10 prism diopters. Now, this divergence excess can be true, so we can true divergence excess, or it can be a pseudo divergence access pattern and the way to distinguish between them is to either patch one eye for about an hour or to use a plus three diopter lens for near in order to relax the accommodation. So if the angle at near remains the same then this will be a true divergence access pattern and if not the patient may have tenacious proximal convergence or high ECA ratio where the angle of XT at near is smaller due to over convergence. The third type is a convergence insufficiency type, where the near deviation is more than 10 prism diopters larger than the distance deviation. So again, in the management of intermittent exotropia, general management principles apply. So firstly, we'll correct any significant refractive error present. And secondly, treat any amblyopia that's present. Thirdly, you may cons consider conservative treatment. Um, such as fusional and convergence exercises or base in prisms. Now, the indications of surgery would depend on a few, few factors. So firstly, if there's an increasing tropia phase with a diminished fusion control. Secondly, if there's poor fusion recovery on cover or uncover testing. Thirdly, if the exotropia is manifest more than 50% of waking hours. And fourthly, if the exotropia is more than 15 prism diopters or increasing and increasing in size. Okay, so just some pictorial examples of the intermittent exotropia. So in A, uh, this shows a child with intermittent exotropia fusing with straight eyes. B, covering uh, white eye dissociates the eyes and breaks fusion. And C, when the cover is removed, the patient manifests the latent exotropia, right eye. This picture now is um, an adult patient with childhood intermittent exotropia that has increased over time to a large angle constant exotropia. In the picture on the left, the patient is fixing with the right eye and her left eye is deviated. And in the picture on the right, the patient is fixing with the left eye and the right eye is deviated. So she has alternating fixation. So I think we've, you know, covered quite a number of topics today. They're quite broad, but really this is just to give you some broad principles on how to approach strabismus. So we've looked at, you know, how to classify strabismus, how to evaluate a patient with strabismus, you know, how to take a history and, and a perform an examination, um, some differential diagnosis, which we've divided into comitant and incomitant causes. And also a couple of um, conditions, common conditions that we've looked into at more detail and also their management. So this last slide is really something that summarizes the general approach to an adult or child with strabismus who you see in a general clinic. So in general, first you need to rule out any neurological causes. Secondly, if it's a non-neurological cause, if it's a child, you want to refer this child to the pediatric or strabismus clinic within one month. If it's an adult, you would choose to discharge the patient. If it's a long-standing strabismus, the patient is not keen on any further surgery with no other ocular issues. You would refer this adult to the uh, strabismus clinic if it's a sudden onset sudden deteriorating strabismus where you refer earlier within a month or if it was long-standing and stable but the patient was keen for surgery you refer 
between four to six months with an orthoptic assessment and arrival. So I hope you found this lecture useful and now will be armed with the knowledge to approach a patient with business. Thank you.